Hello there. My name is Robert De Coleta, and I'm coming to you from the Assyrian Cultural Foundation, where I am a, an Assyrian history instructor. Assyrian history is extremely fascinating. It has many, many periods or epochs going back to about 4000 BC and all the way up until today. All right, so with that, let's get into some Assyrian history. Where? Let's find out where. Where is Hakkari? Hakkari is where the Assyrians lived from a very long time ago, we're not sure, up until the First World War period. So about 1915, 1916, came back there again and then had to leave because of the newly created state of Turkey. It is located in the southeastern corner of today's Turkey. Where did many Assyrians relocate after the First World War, after World War I? Assyrians left to go to Iraq, what is today uh, northern Iraq. They left the area of Urmia, which is in northwestern part of Iran, to go into Iraq, into Russia, into what is today Turkey, into Europe, the United States, and into Australia, mainly. Next question. Where can one find artifacts related to Assyrian history today? Well, first of all, in the land of Assyria itself, that's number one. So going from the city, ancient city of Ashur, A-S-S-U-R, or Assur as it is called sometimes, all the way into southeastern Turkey, and then into the area of Syria, north eastern Syria, and then northwestern Iran. There are Assyrian sites all over these areas, so many artifacts in these areas, and also in the world's great museums in Berlin, Pergamon, in Chicago, where we are today, the Oriental Institute, in New York, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, in London, the uh, British Museum, in Moscow, and St. Petersburg, and in so many other museums, the Louvre in Paris, so many museums, and also importantly in Baghdad. The Baghdad Museum contains tons of Assyrian artifacts. All right, let's see the next question. Where did the Assyrians conduct their military campaigns and conquests? Now, this, of course, goes back to the Assyrian Empire being the world's greatest and first formal and disciplined and structured empire in the world. And the Assyrians began in what is Assyria, which is in northern Iraq, southeastern Turkey, uh, northwestern Iran, and northeastern Syria. And from there, they spread into various lands all over the Levant, so what is today Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, and so on, all the way to Egypt, and then all the way to South uh, Iraq, so reaching the Persian Gulf, and then east into Iran, north into what is today Turkey, what was before Anatolia, all the way into possibly the area of South Russia and the countries there, Georgia, Armenia, and so on. So Assyrians traveled everywhere and including Cyprus and uh, contacts with some of the Greek Isles. So Assyrian armies traveled everywhere along the empire. Where in the world did the Assyrians originate? Okay, great question. And we mentioned the city of Ashur, pronounced Ashur, sometimes it is written as Asur, A-S-S-U-R, or A-S-H-U-R. That is a city located in northern Iraq. It is south of the city of Nineveh. It is north of the city of Baghdad, along the Tigris, on the east or in the western side of the Tigris. That is the origin of the Assyrian people. All right. 
let's take up some more questions. And these have to do with when. Let's see, when. When did Nineveh fall? What a tragic event for the world. 612 BC, a tragic event indeed for the Assyrians, for the Assyrian state, the Assyrian people, the entire Assyrian empire, which was sprawled all over what we know today as the Near East and North Africa. So it was a very momentous event and a very, very devastating and tragic event that shook the ancient world, 612 BC. When did the Assyrians adopt Christianity and how did it influence their culture and society? Of course, Christianity has influenced the culture and society of many peoples all over the world. There is no one definite event, although it is often recalled that the visits of mar -Adde and mar -Mari, Thaddeus and Mari, coming to Assyria in about 33 or around this time and converting Assyrians. But the conversion of the Assyrians was a gradual event. And the ancient Assyrians who worshipped the uh, god Ashur, for example, and other gods like Sin and Shemesh and other gods continued to worship these gods, continued to practice their ancient religion up until about the 3rd century AD or thereabouts. Let's find out when did the Assyrian genocide take place? A very tragic event that took place in 1915. We're talking about the First World War period now. So it took place from 1915, and I would say until 1933 when the massacre at Semele took place, the Assyrians were reeling from these very difficult circumstances of the First World War, which began in 1914, of course, and ended uh, tragically for many peoples in the world around 1919. But the Assyrians continued to suffer up until the Semele massacres, which took the lives of thousands of innocent Assyrians who had sought to make peace with their new countries, newly created countries, Iraq, for instance. Kind of tough to tear some of these. When did Assyrians begin to actively promote and preserve their language and heritage through educational and cultural initiatives? Now, in the modern period, we have to think about the coming of the American missionaries to Urmia, which was in the 1830s, the production of new typesets for the modern Assyrian language, often referred to as Neo-Aramaic or Neo-Syriac sometimes. These were the 1800s, so the 19th century. And then, of course, this spawns the creation of various literary efforts. And the most important of these is the creation of the Assyrian Literary Society, known as Sita Sapreta in Iran, in Tehran specifically, in the 1950s and 60s. And this is when we get great writers and composers and artists like, for example, Rabbi William Daniel, who wrote Qatine, an epic poem in the Assyrian language. We have Adde Alchas, Rabbi Adde Alchas, Rabbi John Alchas, one of the greatest poets in the history of modern Assyrians, and Hannibal Alchas, who is the nephew of John Alchas, the son of Adde Alchas, one of the greatest of Assyrian artists and also a poet himself who wrote in both Assyrian and Persian and other such great writers, Dr. Pira Sarmas, Ashur, um, Babajan Ashuri and others who were part of this effort in Iran that eventually sparked literary activities of Assyrians throughout the world. Okay, let's find out what Let's find out what is the library of Ashurbanipal and what is its significance? What is the 
Ashur Banipal Library or Library of Ashur Banipal. Ashur Banipal was one of Assyria's greatest kings, lived in the 7th century BC, reigned for quite a period of time, was at the height during the time of Ashur Banipal. It was the height of the Assyrian Empire. Ashur Banipal was obsessed with literary tablets and scrolls. And so he gathered from all around his empire thousands, perhaps over 30,000 tablets and scrolls. The scrolls we do not really have anymore. The tablets are well preserved because even with burning, they are maintained. And so the library was burned, it was destroyed, but archaeologists were able to dig up and we were able to get these tablets. And so that made up the Asher Banipal Library. It was a source of great literature, of the sciences back at its time, of historical documents, of religious documents, all of the science of the time. And so that was the Asher Banipal Library. Was it something significant? Of course, it was the gathering of all knowledge during the time of the ancient world in the city of Nineveh. What was the Assyrian literary movement? The Assyrian literary movement really began in Urmia in the 1830s with American missionaries, picked up later by various authors, writers, who were students of those teachers who learned in Urmia and uh, picked up in the city of Tehran and the city of Urmia and wrote a great number of literary works in Iran, but this is something that was picked up by Iraq and other places. And so this movement began with people like Pira Sarmas, Binyamin Arsanis earlier on, William Daniel, and others at De Alhas. All of these people contributed to the creation of what we call a literary movement, and it was really produced in Iran, in the city of Tehran, in the 1950s and 60s. What led our nation to be divided under different names, Assyrian, Chaldean, Syriac? The problem is not national division. The problem here is sectarian division, really church denominations, these church denominations gave their names to the differences and to the various um, terms that are used, such as, uh, for example, the Assyrians who became Catholic use the term Chaldean. The Assyrians who are Orthodox use the term Syriac and sometimes Aramaean. And the Assyrians who are members of the Church of the East tend to use the term Assyrian, or almost exclusively use the word Assyrian. There is no linguistic um, and no religious difference. There are denominational differences between people, and many people who are members of the Syriac Orthodox Church, for example, identify as Assyrians, and uh, the same with the Chaldean Church. Some identify as Assyrian and some as Chaldean. But all of these terms belong to one people. This is the essential point. Whatever you believe, you cannot believe that these people are separate. They are one people and there are different identities, but they are essentially one people. What is the doctrine of Edde? Mar Edde, or Saint Thaddeus, as he is known in uh, English, was a, an apostle of Christ, one of 70, and along with Marmari, he came to the land of Assyria from the land of Palestine, and he is supposed to have converted the Assyrians. And so the story of the conversion of the Assyrian people goes back to the writing that is often referred to as the doctrine of Mar Edde, or Malpanutit Mar Edde in Assyrian. Okay, so let's now ask who? All right. Who was Agapotros? Agapotros is, uh, first of all, the term Aga comes from Turkish or Kurdish, and it refers to a lord or a sir in English. 
Agapotros Ilov was an Assyrian commander, began his life as a poor orphan boy in the villages of Baz, later grew up in Urmi, became a very cosmopolitan person, became a businessman, a wealthy businessman, and then later through the experiences that Assyrians went through in the First World War period had to become a commander of military forces of Assyrians. That is where he gathered his name. That is where his name became famous because of his conflicts with the Turks and the Kurds and he managed to lead successful Assyrian armies uh, all the way up until the end of the First World War. Tragically, he died at a very young age, at the age of 50 in 1932, prior to the massacre at Semele. Who was Marbenyam and Shimon? The last patriarch of the Church of the East, who was consecrated in 1903 at the age of 16, was the last patriarch of the Church of the East in the traditional hamlet of Qochanus, which was where the Assyrian church was stationed since the 1600s. He was the last and he was assassinated in 1918 after attempting to make peace with Simko, a Kurdish leader. Uh, Simko, also known as Simko Lita or Simko the Cursed. Uh, when Marbin Yamin tried to make peace in the interest of the Assyrians and in the entire area, Simko, his response was to assassinate uh, Marbin Yamin Shimon along with a, about 150 of his guards. Marbin Yamin Shimon becomes a very important martyr and is remembered today over a hundred years after he was assassinated. Who was remembered as the last great king of Assyria, and why is that? Well, I would say that Ashurbanipal is a name that everyone should remember as the last great king of Assyria because Ashurbanipal ruled the Assyrian Empire at its geographic, demographic, and probably financial zenith. It was at the height of the Assyrian Empire. After Ashurbanipal's death, the Assyrian Empire, most scholars agree, began to really crumble and collapse and fall into civil war and then eventually its demise in 612 BC in Nineveh and then 609 BC, the last great city of Assyria of Haran. So Ashurbanipal, last great king of Assyria. Who were some influential women in Assyrian society? Well, we can talk about two, one from the ancient past and one from the modern Assyrian history. Naqiya Zakutu, who was um, the wife of King Sennacherib of Assyria, the mother of King Sarhaddun and the grandmother of King Ashurbanipal. Naqiya Zakutu was a very important personality, had made a treaty which was rare for women at the time between herself and others to honor the protection of Ashurbanipal. So Naqiya Zakutu, who lived in the 7th century BC, was a very important person and a very powerful Assyrian queen. And then in the modern days, a person who is very well known by many um, and a bit of a controversial figure, but Surma Khanum, who was the sister of Marbin Yamin Shumun, the patriarch of the Church of the East, and the aunt of the late Mar Ishe Shumun, who was the last patriarch. She was a very uh, independent, a very intelligent, a very literate person in Assyrian society, and for all practical purposes, really led the Assyrian movement during the First World War period and had a very important role in the negotiations for Assyrians that came afterwards. Okay, let's get to why. One of my favorite questions, why do certain things happen? Why was the ancient Assyrian military so formidable in warfare? Well, if I had to give three reasons, it would be that it was the most disciplined and professional. It was very organized 
and it was supported by a statewide system of resources. So the Assyrian Empire supported its military uh, endeavors, and so the Assyrian military became very powerful. It was very organized, it had important ranks, but it was very structured, so people knew where they belonged in the military and they knew their tasks, and it was very professional. The first standing professional army in the world. People talk about iron a lot. Iron has nothing to do with it. It has to do with organization and structure more. Why did the Assyrian independence movement fail? Yes, unfortunately, it did. Well, if there's one very important event to talk about when we talk about the failure of the Assyrian independence movement, it's the First World War period. During the First World War, a lot of factors came together and much destruction was experienced by the Assyrians. And unfortunately, at the time, Assyrian nationalistic endeavors and movements and aspirations were growing, came the First World War period and uprooted everything. And this was particularly so in the town of Urmia, where the Assyrian intellectual uh, center was forming. Why did the British use the Assyrian cause in propagating their interests in Iraq? The, the British used many different peoples all over the world, and so it's proper to put this in context. But with the Assyrians, they used them against the Arabs and the Kurds. They knew that there was a difference in terms of ethnicity and faith, and so they used this to their advantage, and the Assyrians unfortunately became the willing participants in conflicts with Kurds and Arabs on behalf of the British, only to reap their uh, very sorrowful rewards later. Why did the Assyrians use the winged bull or Lamassu as a prominent symbol in their art and their architecture? Well. If you've seen the winged bull, it is a very imposing artistic creation, of course. Now, the Assyrians believe that the Lamassu, or the Shiddu, as it was known in the past, is something that is a, a protective deity. So it's similar to putting, for example, the images of angels by the door in order to ward off evil. So when you put a winged bull, it means you're warding off evil from either the palace or the city. All right, with that, thank you very much. On behalf of the Assyrian Cultural Foundation, I would like to uh, encourage you to ask questions. And if you wanna see a part two to this, please let us know in the comments below or in the questions below. And have a wonderful and happy Thanksgiving. May you have peace and prosperity.